So I actually ended up changing my password to incorrect. So that way, like every time I get my password wrong, my browser just lets me know that like my password's incorrect. Um, but yeah, you know. <laughs> that is the, <laughs> and we are live. So how are you guys doing? We are back live streaming again. Um, <laughs> So stupid, my guy. Yeah, you gotta, you know, you gotta start it off, you know, with a banner. Um, right. But yeah, it is our weekly Sunday live stream where we just talk the talk, walk the walk, but we don't actually walk. We just sit here and talk about cyber stuff because that's what we do. Um, so walk. I haven't seen my toes. In <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, right now we have Adam here. Um, Adam, you can say hi. Yo, yo. Cool, cool. <laughs> we got a uh, sister in here as well. What's up? And then we got the man, the myth, the disappointment, <laughs> Matsi. It's me again. The family disappointing as always. Oh yeah. And you then my wife. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, we got yours truly, Cosmo. Um, hi, how you doing? Um, just a quick, uh, little wannabe walk, rock star. Wow. Would you look at that? Um, just a little quick, um, I guess to throw out there right now on, um, the cyber store, we have our breast cancer awareness wallpaper for, um, breast cancer. It's completely free. Like, so is everything on the website, basically. Um, <laughs> So if you guys want to kind of represent that breast cancer support with the Cosmodium name, definitely check that out. Uh, but yeah, you know, I think October is like Breast Cancer Awareness Month, um, like Hispanic Heritage Month, something like that. Cybersecurity Awareness Month, I think, too. And then it's also yeah, like... Yeah, Cybersecurity Awareness um, And there's also some other stuff. So I probably should do some stuff for cyber awareness. Um, I guess, you know what? That's it. This is what the stream is. <laughs> Technically, actually, with the topic or the flag for today well, um right so quick before we get off of that i think we should also mention our project that we're planning to do right halloween. so um this halloween we are planning to do a live stream where again we're kind of do something similar to this where we're kind of all talking hanging out um there will be king of the hill games and a lot of cool ctf stuff but outside of just the cyber security focus on it um, the whole point of the stream is to promote um, breast cancer support and breast cancer awareness research and solutions. Um, we are working with a company, I believe it's Heart of Hope, is that correct? Hope, hope with the heart. Hope with the heart. Um, hope for the heart, sorry, that's the one. Hope, hope for the heart. For the heart. Um, so yeah, we're working with um, Hope for the Heart and they will be joining us on the stream for the beginning, kind of introduce themselves, talk about their... Um, I guess their work and how all the funds that any any funds or donations that come through the stream will all be focused and donated towards supporting breast cancer. So hopefully that should be pretty fun. You know, cough games and um, that all. I mean, that whole thing. So um, if I miss anything, David, you can yeah. uh, or you can go ahead and turn on that. Yeah. So just to give a quick recap, um, August or sorry, not August, October thirty first, we're gonna get together. Um, we're gonna take the first couple minutes just to give introductions, explain what the organization is, get a couple guest speakers going. We're hoping to get a couple other guests. We're not gonna say names just yet, but uh, it should be a fun afternoon. So the plan is just to get you know coffee games going to keep everybody kind of going as we're doing these donations and encourage a little bit of competitiveness and you know touch upon those cybersecurity skills that we normally touch in our day-to-day -day videos. Yeah. Um, other than that, like that's this is the time that uh, we're gonna ask you know a little more than we normally would. These donations aren't for us. Cosmodium is not taking a single penny from any of this. Every bit of that donation will be sent directly to Hope for the Heart, and we will be afterwards getting Hope for the Heart to verify this. That way everybody knows for sure that these funds are going to a good place for a good cause. Yeah. Um, hopefully this is something um, that should be pretty fun for you guys and also something that's morally just and, you know, just fun all around. Um, so now I guess we can kind of dive into the flag for today, which if you're looking at the name of this video, you might be super confused. Um, but I guess that's kind of the pun if you see the thumbnail about the flag being obfuscate. Clearly, the flag is obfuscated. 
um, feel free to figure it out. But um, what we're kind of talking about today is kind of like that, it's kind of hanging off of our previous stream about rudiments and getting into hacking. We're going to kind of talk about more of that online safety front, talk about how um, you guys can stay safe online, good online practices, um, and unlike the intro to this stream, um, <laughs> kind of focus on better security practices and such. Um, so if anyone wants to jump in, kind of lead the conversation on online safety, feel free to do so. So um, I guess, go ahead, Aaron. go ahead. All right, so um, I guess maybe like a month or two ago, I was using uh, like my browser's password manager and then I was like watching videos and looking at uh, Hack5 payloads for the rubber duck and stuff and saw like pulling the passwords and stuff from the browser. So then I moved on to um, LastPass instead of using my browser as a password manager. So now I use a uh, password manager and I've been changing my passwords to mix them up. i am using the password generator that LastPass uh, gives. Yeah, no, that's that's good practice, dude. Uh, how about you, Monty? So, I guess I give a little overview of some of the topics we plan to cover today. Um, we're not just going over passwords and VPN type stuff. We're also going, we're going over stuff like uh, credit card safety, a couple of different applications and services that I found that um, I use personally just to make sure that that sort of data doesn't get stolen. Um, just to give an idea, this whole video isn't about how to hide yourself in any sort of a legal manner like that when you're trying to do something. Um, this is strictly for people to stay safe on the internet, for people to mitigate those risks and also to give you some resources to check and see, you know, what the potential damage is for something like that and to see if you are in a potentially vulnerable state. Um, so yeah, this is all, this goes kind of through our central theme through most of our live streams, you know, fun but safety at the same time. Like, find your community, find your safety, like, you know, find your routine and that's what this is going to be is about building that route mm -hmm. of security and privacy just making sure that you are you know safe when you are enjoying the things you are because sometimes when it comes to security research you're going to find yourself in some sketchy places learning some sketchy like in some dodgy places learning some you know semi sketchy things for good security purposes so yeah. you know stay safe if you don't fully trust your vendor there's always ways to ensure that your safety is No, that's weird. That's weird. How about you, uh, sister? You want to touch on anything? Um, it's basically the same as Adam, but then I use like keypad. I think it is. Uh, I uh, change my password, like because it's a big game used to. I normally just use the same password over and over again, but uh, that wasn't good practice, so I just changed it all up, made it better. Just like normally, I would just add a certain. Thing to my password, but then I learned to like use complete different words or complete like letters and all that kind of stuff. And normally I just generate a password uh, inside the keypad to make it like strong and uncrackable. So, gotcha. Yeah, um, just, yeah. No, that's awesome. It seems like right now we have kind of a consistent theme about passwords in that front. So I guess we can dive into that topic about password safety for a little bit and kind of move on from there. Um, I remember when I was like first getting into the whole um, like online world, digital world with passwords, I um, I think everyone has their fair share of, you know, reused passwords when they first got in. Um, I kind of did this weird thing where I would have like the passwords that were like repeated, but for specific things like I had like all my emails had the same password, but like all my social media accounts had the same password, but they would be different at the same time. Um, like between categories. Um, I don't know why on earth I did that, but I'm glad I kind of moved out of that and used, you know, unique passwords and um, password managers and the such. And I know Adam was talking about um, those like payloads you'll see about extracting passwords off of web browsers because password managers and saving your credentials to your web browser are two completely different things. Um, that seems to be a pretty common misconception within like the digital world. But um, I did make a video when I was using the Bash Bunny to extract these passwords off of um, 
your you know web browser because it's safe to the quote unquote cloud as well but it's also saved directly onto your computer right and you can just extract these straight off and I've done videos on this in the past so um, it's very important to kind of have that um, I guess security persistence and making sure that like that security routine as Matsu was saying about making sure like you need to keep having I guess you know that I guess security routine and making sure you know you're using good strong passwords um, different in Again, there's plenty of password manager services out there. I personally use Bitwarden, um, but there's plenty of great ones like LastPass, KeyPass, um, Dashlane even. Um, so yeah, definitely something you should check your time and look into because it's super important if you're using repeated passwords um, that if one of your accounts were to get compromised by using that same password on multiple accounts, those other accounts would also be compromised. Um, so it's very important to make sure that all your accounts can be safe by managing your passwords through a password manager and using these strong and unique passwords as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, another thing, too, is I talked about building that security profile. Um, I mentioned briefly on this, we want to try to give you resources not only to start that you know, security profile, but also to give you a way to check and validate that security profile as well. Um, I just put a link in the chat for Have I Been Pwned. It's a great site. Um, more or less, you can search up based on your passwords or based on uh, the emails that you use. And it'll tell you if your email has been part of a data breach that's happened. It'll tell you when the data breach happened, um, a little bit of information about it. Typically, um, it'll tell you like how the passwords were stored, whether they were in clear text, hash, um, if any of them have been known to be cracked, stuff like that. So. That's the sort of stuff we want to cover today. Not just a routine, but also a way to validate and check. So, you know. yeah. Uh, so yeah, we've brought up password managers, some of this stuff. Um, I guess the important thing to really look at is the fact that your email is kind of the core of all these different things. That's the thing that hooks everything together. That's going to be your security validation if you oh, yeah. get your password. The moment that email is compromised, I mean, it goes down from there. So it really. <laughs> And then it's the first day we should start on email. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, to add on to your point with that, with the emails, it's like I know plenty of people, um, you can use like sign in with Google um, as an option for accounts, which is on, makes, you know, signing into certain accounts a lot easier. Oh, yeah. um, but with that, um, you have to understand that all these accounts that you may sign into Google with are all backed up through your Gmail password, which is fine. You can do that. But you best make sure that your Gmail password is uh, something secure and strong that you're changing often and making sure you're not um, giving out there in a, you know, bad or unresponsible or irresponsible way. More than just your applications you sign into, um, for anybody who uses most, any of the Google applications, uh, Samsung users or modern ones, um, if you save any sort of card information that you use for any reoccurring service, uh, you use purchases for apps or music, stuff like that, that's stored within your account. So I just recently transferred to a new phone and was thinking, oh, great, I've got to do this purchase. The you know problem is that, oh, I'm not going to input all my new credit cards. But no, all that's transferred over with it. And looking back on the whole process, I never once, outside of entering my password, was asked to validate that I am who I am. Never, you know, my phone... My previous phone never went off and said, hey, there's a new sign in here. You know, sometimes it procs, sometimes it doesn't. Um, that's a good little feature that Google does have. And there's a lot of jokes about it, you know, random sign-ins from different places, but it feels like Google hostage for it. But those little security features are nice, but they don't always proc. Sometimes it randomly happens, sometimes it doesn't happen at all. But there's a lot more than just your services you're connected to. Uh, as far as the uh, stream, uh, by the way, it's about security. Um, the flag is obfuscated. That's the whole theme of today is obfuscating your data. So if any of those are wondering, it's a, a hash if you want to go ahead and poke around to figure out what hash it is. It shouldn't be too far. It's yeah. common. Um, and you kind of add on to your point about the credit card thing. First of all, what you're talking about, that's actually pretty weird. And um, I, you may have told me about <laughs> this before, but that's actually like hearing this now, kind of understanding what you're talking about. That's kind of unsettling on some level um but 
like how irresponsible you can be handled and um for the record going forward just letting you guys know that the products we're talking about they're not sponsoring us we're not getting paid to say anything good or bad about them um what we are saying is we're just talking to you guys about the products that we use that we tend to trust in that sort of thing so when i'm talking about this right now um privacy.com um is a great website if you yes, use sir. a lot of um credit cards and online um, like purchases. Um, if you're not familiar with privacy.com, they have, um, basically they'll like have virtual cards that are connected to your credit card. So when you're making accounts or putting your um, credit card data on websites, if their databases or if that website were to be hacked and there were some sort of data leak, um, your, cred your credit card information wouldn't just be thrown out onto the internet. You can easily cancel the card and it's not, um, you know affecting you in any way there's also i'm sure um a lot of other benefits outside of that but it is a service that i trust and i use um so privacy.com is definitely something you should check out if you are typically within the realm of like online purchases and such i recommend that for a lot of different places because not only is it about that uh security of that data being leaked, but it's got a nice little feature that also prevents if that data is stolen. Uh, you're able to set a max. Uh, you're able to set a max of how much you want that card to be charged per month. It can be a one-time type card. So if that data is stolen and you only want to have a charge of ten dollars, they're not getting more than ten dollars out of that card, and it'll let you know if that uh, it tried to exceed that purchase. So it's an easy way to make sure that if you are losing, it's a very manageable collected loss as well as kind of a heads up like, hey, this is not to be trusted. They tried to charge you more than what they said they were going to. Mm -hmm. So that's another little built-in feature. You know, you talk about there's more to it. Um, going back to the email thing, certain steps you can take to go forward and, um, you know, kind of increase that security, especially through Gmail accounts or your email accounts, whatever you use for that stuff. If you're going to use two-factor authentication anywhere, your email is going to be the place to do it. That two-factor authentication is going to be the you know, the saving grace for a lot of it, and uh, Google's got a lot of built-in two-factor authentication. You know, I made that joke earlier; they're holding you hostage. But you know, that's that's a good thing. I would rather them be cautious of a normal sign-in and it be okay than to just allow a non, you know, safe sign-in from somebody else who's trying to steal my data. Yeah. But two-factor authentication is a good one. If you guys are on the App Store and you're looking for a cool little two-factor authentication app, I use Offy. Um, yeah, I've always. never had problems with it. It's uh, it's real simple. Uh, most applications will have, you know, a little two-factor authentication set up area. Your app will plug in with it. So what it does is have you enter in a code, it'll share it with that service, and then from there, the server that you're authenticating to will also link up with the, and they'll just be on the same key pair generation. So it gives you about a 30-second window for, you know, if one code's entered and there's, you know, network delay. So. You don't have to worry too much. It's got built-in stuff for if your network's slow and stuff. You don't have to worry about on your account. Yeah. No, that's cool. Yeah, I use Authy as well. I, uh, I think it changes the timer depending on what um, application is using. So I know like Discord, Yes. I think is like 30. And then maybe for some like banking ones, it changes it to like a lower time, which is pretty smart. Hmm. I actually haven't heard of this one before, but that's actually really cool. So the idea behind the key pair exchange is that um, there may be a slight delay between the app, what the server is expecting as the code response. So say if the previous code is only on screen for 30 seconds. When that 30 seconds up, that code is not done, especially if you go on type B, you can still hit enter and send. And the server will still accept that code for however many seconds afterwards, depending on what the servers do. That way, if there is a low bandwidth situation, or lag, and it's not going to last out. There's some cool features behind that. Um, if you guys are ever looking for a cool nerdy project to do, I definitely recommend. Um, we've got 2FA app security and stuff like that, and the way they've come around some issues that were originally serviceable. Gotcha. But uh, honestly, like going back to the original point, like security on your email, that's the you take all your services, you set different passwords for everything. What's gonna happen is that password reset link is gonna be sent gonna be sent to that email and file. 
So if that email is compromised, it doesn't matter how good your password is, how many different applications you've got doing your password. If that gets cracked, it's kind of just down from there. You're not going to get a very so. Yeah. I mean, no, that's facts. Um, I also wanted to kind of touch on um, another YouTuber on the platform. His name is The Hated One. I don't know if you guys have seen this content before. Yes. But The Hated yeah, One is that. easily the king of privacy in online safety when it comes to YouTube. Um, at least he's definitely up there in my book. Um, so definitely check out his channel. Um, but going through that, he made a video about um, like kind of the concepts of how to structure your online safety as well as maintaining a certain level of privacy because he's very <laughs> he's very uh fond of privacy um without uh, deep diving into the topic um but he has kind of like talked about a sort of system of kind of separating certain accounts and certain um areas of your life online by separating them into different I guess areas and not always having to go for the mainstream product or service when there are plenty of great alternatives that may work even better or worse than the um, mainstream service that you may be looking at. Um, so I know, for example, he kind of talks about a system where you can kind of separate like your personal life into like, let's say you're using ProtonMail or to the know that um, those are great email services that outside of the world of Gmail, I think you really only should use like a Gmail for like business or school related stuff and keep a lot of your personal life out of it and kind of focus your, I guess, more personal stuff towards like um, ProtonMail, Tunanoda and such. And he's kind of talking about how you can separate um, these lives of yours on different services and kind of talk, making, making it so that way it's harder to easily um, build an identity or a profile off of you by separating this information, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, I'm sure I'm blotching a little bit of it and kind of summarizing, paraphrasing about um, his topics about it. Um, but I thought it was just an interesting kind of concept that he's talked about in the past. Um, but he also talks about plenty of alternative services, like not having to um, always rely on Google. I know I'm touching a little bit into the world of privacy a little bit, but I still think... Um, when it comes to online safety, privacy is one of the fundamental um, pieces that you should have within that world of online safety. Um, so definitely, again, check it out. Um, Matsi dropped the link in there. And um, yeah, so definitely <laughs> um, check out so some of the hate. What you were talking about, that compartmentalizing and everything, that kind of breaking apart your you know personal life yeah. versus your work stuff and everything. It's a great idea. That's how I personally do that myself. Um, Proton Mail is my email of choice, not only because of their email service, but they do also a VPN service. It's nice for, you know, just a little bit of extra added security, and I do plan on touching on VPNs later, but the main thing I want to pull apart from that is that comp the compartmentalizing. Sorry about that. Um, there's a nice OS out there called Cubes. Um, it's pretty heavy, so I wouldn't recommend running it on a lower browser, or not a lower browser, a lower level system. Uh, you're definitely going to want some hardware behind it, but uh, it's definitely built out to be that way, essentially, from the get-go. It's one OS that runs a whole bunch of virtualized compartments you can set up with different security levels. Um, there's a couple pre-built, like Tails OS is one of the VMs that you can just spawn from without having to download or, you know, convert it over. Um, all the way to just a normal, like, oh, I'm going to shop in this particular VM, which am I shopping? So I hope do shopping and then you can close it, save your data, or you can completely delete it, trash it, and start a new. Um, it's a nice little security you know, OS, but while we're on the topic of OS, um, a lot of people in the security field use Linux, and I'm going to touch upon an old problem that used to exist, Kali Linux, and a problem that you still see today. Um, back in the day when you would install Kali Linux, the original default credentials were root, and then root spelled backwards was the password. Tours, whatever it was, you know, shortening it as. Uh, there was a lot of people leaving these default passwords, and there's stories of people who, you know, went to DEF CON, they created a separate user account with lower privileges, but they never touched this root user other than to create this. So they still had this admin over their entire system sitting on there with this default password. People were just uh, doing 
what's it, password spraying? Is that what it's called? Mm -hmm. You just take default yeah, yeah. passwords and, you know, brute force it across the network to see what we won't accept it. But they were more or less doing that, and there was a bunch of people getting put up on the wall. She left their default group with the uh, Tor password, and that was that was always some good stories. I think it was, I think it was like my second year into getting into security. I kind of realized that it was a problem hearing stories about it and seeing it real fun kind of watch and see some of the horror stories that came from it. Yeah. Um, managing those user accounts. Uh, I brought it up a minute ago, having a, an admin account and having lower account. account. Um, when you're a sysadmin, which is where my background comes from, we have, um, we're setting permissions a little, I wouldn't say saying, but the idea is who, where, and when. So the idea is who needs access to this, where do they need access, and for how long? So Diane from Marketing may need access to the shared drive for admin stuff for you know her normal day-to-day -day work from her 9-to-5 job. But there's no reason at 1 a.m. she should be signed in there tweaking the document, which means that we would restrict her access there. And I think that's the best way to look at your security, too. Um, always oh, yeah. keep an eye on that, you know, who, when, or, you know. Where am I going to be browsing at? How long am I usually browsing there? How frequently am I visiting there? Am I seeing stuff that says that I've been there a little more frequently than I should? You know, looking out for those emails from Amazon or from, you know, whatever have, uh, website. Oh, you left some stuff in your cart you didn't purchase. Well, I haven't been on that site in two months. That's a little scary. You know, stuff like that. Um, yeah. Just keep in mind, like, the frequency where you're visiting. It's those little clues that you'll pick up that kind of let you know something be off. But... No, I, I just totally. Keep those. Yeah, but. No, no, I was just saying, like, I totally, like, agree. I think that's actually, like, a really valid point. And how you're kind of entering the space of not, not only online safety on that personal level, but online safety within the corporate world and the industry and such. Because that tends to be a major, I guess, quote, vulnerability um, within a lot of the, I guess, security industry. And not even just security industry, but general um like company corporate enterprise and such um just the lack of safety within the employees within an organization can be the downfall for a lot of these organizations as well um so keeping that like healthy security practice is not only beneficial for you on a personal level in your personal life but your work life um your the company you work for because if a hacker were to use you as an attack vector and use you as their way into the organization um that puts a lot of pressure on you and um the best way you can kind of avoid a lot of these types of situations is through having that healthy kind of security routine within your personal life and apply it to your work life as well i think the rule of thumb is just try to keep as low privilege as you can you want to be able to do as like only the bare minimum of what you need on that. That's the whole way I see it. Never give a service, you know, root if it doesn't need root to run. Mm. Um, never, you know, give a service part of that root group. This is going back to Linux stuff. Uh, for those of you who are one of those users and are confused right now, um, you can assign privilege levels to program and applications. Um, never give anything higher privileges than. I mean, we do CTFs quite frequently. Uh, try hacking, hack the box type stuff, and. Those are the things we're looking for. Those are the things we're abusing. Somebody gave in-map root you know, permissions when it didn't need it. Well, guess what? Now we've got an interactive root shell that we just use to escalate our privileges. Yeah. Stuff like that. Your idea is to create the lowest level possible to prevent anybody from stepping up higher. Yeah, no, that's... Um, even those local passwords. Oh, okay. No, no, no. You can finish my bad. So those local passwords, those are a little harder to get to. Uh, let it's real quick about what passwords stored, it's stored, and you know, they don't mess around with the permissions. Uh, typically, by default, a lot of OSs, especially Parrot and Kali, I talked about earlier, that little um, default credentials problem that was originally the Kali has since been fixed. And it was there with Parrot during its first couple of iterations where they would create a very simple default username and password that was known amongst everybody in search default credentials for Kali Linux, and there it was, root and tour. And uh, they've now since made it to where during their setup, ask what your user is, password. 
And then from there, they give a user that part of the pseudo group, so you can engage in pseudo activities, but you require your password to enter versus it at that root user. Mm. You could just run a pseudo command, and it would take it as it, you know, it would take it as root permission to that password. Yeah. So there's been a lot of steps that have gone through. And, uh, for those of you who don't know Parrot OS, I, I live by it not just because of its security and, you know, the the cybersecurity field, but also for its personal security tools. Yes. That has built in. Yes. Yeah. That's I was one waiting for someone really to dive into like. that on um, Parrot. Because um, one of the key differences between Parrot and Kali when it comes to security is the Parrot level on that personal front and that privacy front. Um, I think Kali is honestly one of the greatest Linux distros that's ever been created. I'm not saying anything bad against it. In fact, it's the industry standard. Like if you're working in the security field, you should be using Kali like on your engagements, on your assessments. Um, I think what the good thing about Parrot and kind of add on to your point about what you're saying is like Parrot is one of the like a better like personal distro. You can kind of trust and rely on it and use it for stuff a little bit outside of just that security world because of all of the privacy features that um, you know Parrot has to supply for you. Um, so I think that's well, awesome. Parrot's not just a, a security engagement. It's either they also have their home version. Which yeah, they have a home version. Have yeah, yeah. Ubuntu off you. And that comes with all their standard um, security features that you would find in security. It just lacks the security research tools, which to me is awesome to see that we are branching out from Ubuntu being very much the standard of home distro. I know there's a lot of people who swear by Arch and everything, but to be honest, everybody who first got into this most likely started with some sort of copy. If they didn't jump directly into Kali, they were rushing it too fast, but... Yeah, I used whatever to use it comes Linux. <laughs> I used to use Kali Linux, and then after a while, I'm like, let me try Parrot, and then I just fall in love with Parrot ever since. Oh. The guys over at Parrot are really, really good. Most of their stuff. It's a very user friendly. It's like right now I'm currently, like I'm, I'm this is my primary distro. Uh, I use it. I know a lot of people, you know, get upset with, oh, how, how is your primary or daily driver or security? You know, well the thing is, I'm a workaholic, so the little free time I do get, I dedicate our CTF team, which means that anytime I am doing free time wise, it's always security work. Yeah. So for those questioning daily drive stuff for Parrot and Kali like gaming and stuff like that I'm just going to tell you Linux is probably not but if you just like listening to music YouTube stuff like that Netflix no you can get Spotify can on you can get Spotify on Parrot oh yeah, yeah. that's uh, yeah, <laughs> I've gotten on here now uh, it, it's it's usable it's just yeah. Yeah. you know pick those alternatives for security and I don't want it to sound also like I'm bashing Windows but Windows has got a lot of stuff that you can use to harden it there's a lot of services that go hand in hand that can be um, Windows I think just takes a little longer simply because Windows is meant to be friendly open yeah. system and there's so much more um, attack surface than there is oh, Linux. Oh yeah. <laughs> because I mean when you hear about a vulnerability that comes usually Windows users are completely screwed because this that and the third or you know, outside of hardware vulnerabilities, I wanna say at least eighty to ninety percent. Yeah, it is the most vulnerable operating system currently out there. Um, I mean, businesses run off of it. Uh, Yeah. Schools, educational, medical stuff, like all that's running on Windows, so it makes sense to target those. Yeah, I mean, no, I was going to say that too. It's like, it's not like it's their fault. They're not purposely going out of their way to make it vulnerable. It's just Windows is the most popular, hence it's the most targeted, hence it's the most vulnerable. Um, Well, another thing that it kind of has... I would say Linux has going for it in security base or against uh, Windows. The fact that it's open, you know, there's yeah. people who are using Linux every day who, because it's open source, they can look at that stuff and they, they, I mean, they're curious. Where's my security at? People way smarter than me who've been looking at the source code for a long, long time, versus Windows, which is a, a closed off source code um, for the most part. It kind of makes it harder for people to be able to look at it and get back to mind. So the only people who are really doing that source code are those like people. Microsoft. Yeah, and um, the developers actually have to sign an NDA. They can't talk about yep. um, any of the, I guess, features that they were implementing into like any security parts or uh, where that information that they're collecting is going or anything like that. 
Um, like, they aren't legally allowed to talk about it. Yeah, I mean, so it fact. goes all the way, security goes all the way down, not to just the information you put out there, but how you store that information. Um, data is at its most vulnerable when it's stagnant. Mm -hmm. um, leaving files with important stuff just sitting there. That sort of stuff is what I worry about the most, because there's protocols all over encryption. I mean, implementing a simple VPN, regardless of where your stance is on how safe VPNs are, to the average person listening on your Starbucks Wi-Fi, they're not going to grab your through me. They don't have the resources, nor they have time there and, you know, do that. You're not as important as you think you are if that's what you think is going on. But, you know, simple <laughs> wrapping of that data through, you know, the movement of it, that's, that's the easiest way to do it. It just, you know, VPN proxy type setups. Um, proxies are a little... I don't want to say I recommend proxies because of the hard versus VPN with all their fancy, I think, you know, I think for those things. who are, like, newer, uh, VPNs are probably the best option for them. Oh, uh, definitely. Because it's an but, easy, kind of quick to understand, click a button, and boom, you got privacy. <laughs> and for those who are curious in the field and want to be able to do this stuff and take their privacy a little more in their own hands, um, OpenVPN is a great alternative using any sort of off-the-shelf products. Personally, I don't mess with OpenVPN unless it's for like a direct site-to-site a -site connection. Typically, I'll go ahead and just trust, you know, uh, ProtonMail. If I'm trusting them for my email, why would I not trust them on web browsing? That's the way I see it, but you can easily do your own thing open. And it's a cool little project to play around with, set up, but it, it's, it'll teach you a little more about those technologies if you your ID, what, you know, your security, like what data you're actually sitting through, what that data looks like normally, which is encrypted. Um, it's one of those things, like, we can talk about it all day, tell you what well, it's going to look like, here's what it, you know, sounds like, here's what it feels like, here's what it tastes like type situations, but until you get there, pop under the hood and start to play around with it, you really don't get a full grasp for it. So anybody who's listening, I highly recommend spinning up a cheap droplet. Um, what is the site for all the uh, VP, what's it called? VPSs. Oh, uh, yeah. So, DigitalOcean. So, DigitalOcean's got cheap uh, VPSs. For those who don't know, VPSs is VPS virtual private server. Dollar. What's up? I was just clarifying that a VPS is a virtual private server. Those. Yes, virtual yeah. private server. But, uh, I mean, I'd say get out there and play with it. It's one of those things where you'll you'll learn more from it, I feel, and it'll kind of give you a better sense of what you're actually putting out there, what could be at risk uh, for it. Uh, there's a lot of standpoints right now and a lot of uh, opinions on whether VPN providers are being honest or are not keeping it, if that's something you're worried about, but I don't think there is an alternative for that. If you want your security and you want to guarantee it and you want to feel like it's in your hands and you know what's going on, the software is open source, so the whole concept of I can see it, people who are smarter than me have seen it, that funky going on. By all means, open VPN is your way of doing it and simple droplets, you know, cheap alternative stuff like that is really easy to set up and just play around with those types of projects and really, you know, get that confidence back in your security and browser. Yeah. Yeah. I uh use pay version of Proton VPN and I haven't had any issues with it. I uh love it. <laughs> I think uh, they're too. They've got a lot of options for it. Um, they've even got their secure cord VPN, oh, which are wow. real nice. So there's some that'll be like you can even drop through Tor some of them got to that they'll drop through that network and whatnot. I don't know if they have one dedicated node that they're dropping, or if the you know actual Tor browser method of you know we randomly generate every time a connection. But I do know that they are configured to run through that tool. Yeah, I'm looking at it now, and um, there's like different ones you could pick just a normal France server or a France tour server. So I know mm -hmm. on a couple of them. So, yeah, and they give you an idea. Um, it's not picking a tour out of France, it'll first do that connection to France, and then from there. So, yeah. just to clarify a little bit, they're not identifying tour nodes in a certain area. That way, everybody's not freaking out about it. But uh, I mean, there's services out there that if you are low on cash, 
there's options. Oh, Your yeah. security doesn't have to go out the window because you don't have a wall that flush with cash. There's always options, and I think a lot of the security industry and your learning should be done without spending money. I think, honestly, that's going to give you the best idea. Hack 5 tools, we mentioned on it before when it comes to your learning, they're great, but the moment you have gone through your own device off of a smaller platform that do the same thing, it'll give you a greater understanding of what those Hack 5 tools the moment you use, you know, GUI, or the moment you use uh, command line version tools, it, you know, gives you a better understanding of what's going on in the GUI. Oh, hey, yeah, this option's kind of limited. I want to do this. Now you know what it's. Um, try to stay as, you know, cash free on your learning, but privacy especially, um, as you can for as long as you can. It, it, I feel like it makes it feel a little better and also makes that commitment to it a little less risky. Or like you're like like it's weighted. It makes it more fun. You're not pained. You're now doing it on your own. But back to the privacy section of it. Uh, we've covered on the OS section, which I think is what we've covered on the password section. Uh, we touched a little bit on privacy.com. That one's also it's a it's a really great service. Um, is there anything else you guys want to bring up? I mean, yeah, there's um, a lot of different areas we could cover. I think because you were talking about um, you were talking about the tour nodes, I believe, and about these alternative services. So I was going to digress kind of off of that topic and kind of go into um, a little bit of the search engine or browsers kind of, I guess, yes. um, tutorial or I mean, not uh, like that area of discussion. Um, so I know there's tons of browsers out there. And I know if you ask any hacker, um, they're immediately going to say you don't need a VPN, just use Tor. Um, and I figured, I mean, that might not be the most <laughs> practical thing for a lot of people, even though um, I definitely would suggest that that's like your thing and you're um, kind of like into that and go for it. I've written articles about um, a specific online safety thing on the website that had to deal with Tor and such. I can't remember the specific article, but if I remember it, I'll pin it in a comment in uh, the description. But um, when it comes to certain web browsers and such, um, I think it's very important to understand, um, first of all, like the, I guess, your right of privacy that you're kind of being restricted from within these browsers. Um, so I know the world's most popular browser is, um, I believe it's like what, Chrome? And then like Edge or whatever. Uh, whatever. I would say Chrome and Edge and then Firefox behind it. Yeah. Um, so I know a lot of people use Chrome. I mean, it's um, very practical if you're in the world of a lot of the G Suite stuff like Google and um, like G-Docs, Slides, um, Sheets, whatever. Um, my personal suggestion for if you're an active Chrome user is to try out Brave because it's Chromium based. I know, Adam, you use uh, Brave as well. And um, that's kind of become my alternative for Chrome because it's Chromium based, but it also has a lot of fantastic privacy features as well as there's like Tor implementation in it too and it's all this other stuff. Um, and it works basically within that same, uh, I guess, privacy and um, like security level. Uh, thank you, Matsi, for dropping that link in there. Um, gotcha. and <laughs> um, but as a more, because I use um, like Brave for a lot of the business stuff, because I still have to work with a lot of the um, G Suite things. I got the YouTube channel. I got this and the third. Um, but on a more personal stuff, when I use for, I guess my more, I guess more personal work when I'm working on courses or making videos, um, I'm going to be using Firefox because that's just a browser I know I can trust, and especially how there's a lot of customization and optimization you can do to ensure your privacy. I know the hated one actually has a tutorial on setting up Firefox to ensure um, you get the most privacy out of it and the most security out of it. Um, so it's definitely something I would suggest checking out if you're um, a consistent Firefox user. That That's the video I use to kind of set up my Firefox. And um, honestly, yeah, so Firefox and Brave are kind of the two main browsers I use, Brave for business and Firefox for a more um, personal level. Well, you guys on, can digress that as well. Well, we're on that customization of you know, privacy within Firefox and everything. Plugins are a great one. Uh, for any of those who are using uh, Parrot and Kali right now, um, you know that it comes installed with Privacy Badger, um, ublock, and SSA, or HTTPS everywhere. 
those are some really great plugins that are actually provided. Who are the creators? I know. Yes, the EFF. The EFF provides um, support for those applications. They've you know dumped a lot of money into making sure those are free for everybody as a way of staying safe. Mm. So if you are using um, you know a non Linux or non security based uh, distro right now, using Firefox and you want a little bit of extra security. Add those in. They're free. They take just a second to install, and they don't affect the way you browse. They're not going to tweak the way you do anything. But those little bit of extra things in the background are just nice to have. Oh, um, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I did those too. Yeah, 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 I know what you're talking about. So, like, Privacy Badger. That'll go and eat up your cookies that are meant to be tracking. So, uh, that's a real nice one. HTTPS Everywhere tries to make sure that every bit of data is sent through um, HTTPS, and it's a nice way to prevent those downgrade attacks. Um, what was it? Dirty Poodle or something a long time ago it was a nice little downgrade attack. It, it's a weird name, but it was... Um, <laughs> <laughs> HTTP. Uh, there's a couple different attacks that have been used. Um, I know that like SSL strip... That's one of the biggest ones. Uh, it's still kind of currently known and going. Yeah, Ettercat uses the SSL strip. That's the type of service right there, that little plugin that'll help prevent that sort of stuff going through your data. It'll just try to prevent anything from being downgraded from um, a lesser version of HTTP. Yeah. Um, uh, one we went over. Brave. Okay. Is Brave actually has a built in like ad blocker, or not ad blocker, mm -hmm. but like cookie? Cookie tracker blocker or whatever that has a built in where you can disable it for certain websites and stuff like that, so you might need a plugin. So, we went over Tor a minute ago and you said there were some downsides to using Tor. So, I think the big thing we should cover on the downsides is there's several bigger sites that people use quite commonly that actually block Tor. So, the upside to Tor is the more users that are there, obviously, anonymous it gets because everybody who's on the Tor node. Which using the Tor nodes also becomes a Tor node themselves, which means you kind of a pool of people there to bounce around. Yeah. The problem is that because Tor is so open and it's free and anybody can download it, anybody can, it means that sometimes it's used for shady business. Sometimes people use those Tor nodes to hide their duties when they're doing stuff. So a lot of them actually, you know, they won't accept traffic from, you know, Tor nodes, which is, I'd say, pretty fairly reasonable, but it's also at the same time. You know, it sucks. It is what it is. Yeah. So, you know, Tor's nice and all, but do realize it has its limitations yeah. on the security front, but kind of that accessibility type thing, like a lot of places are stopping that door, like the security bounces are going to hit you you get the so. mm. Yeah, I guess that's kind of what um, Adam was kind of talking about a little bit too with um, Brave. I know they have like a built-in Tor routing type thing, so that way you can kind of activate Tor within the browser on certain websites so that way you can have that little bit extra level of privacy i don't know too much about because i haven't used the feature too much because i use brave mainly for a lot of the work stuff for cosmodium and such but um definitely something you should consider checking out and i was reviewing the article um that i wrote a while back and i forgot about this point that i brought up in there about um social contracts right so it's a so an, in the real world a social contract is an agreement between the government and its people where people give up certain rights for certain freedoms um with the world of privacy and security um these kind of social contracts are some kind of concepts i guess you can kind of incorporate into the way you work your digital life um kind of an example this can be like making sure like the services that you're using that you're kind of relying off of um are worth that, I guess, level of privacy invasion that will come with it. Um, and you can still kind of limit that invasion through the concepts that the hated one has kind of covered on his channel before. Um, but uh, it was just an interesting point that I kind of forgot about, about just making sure like how you can limit um, your level of privacy invasion and continue to ensure your online safety is through how you can kind of check to see like, hey, is this at, let's say you're using, I want to call out a company in specific. Let's say you have like a, um, like a document writing app. You're like, Hey, is this worth it? Are there any alternatives that work just as well or better, uh, that won't kind of disallow or kind of affect the work that I kind of want to do 
Um, so um, just kind of an interesting kind of point that you can kind of start incorporating into your life a little bit and ensuring that, hey, you know, you are doing what's best for you and um, making sure that your digital life is um, safe and insured. I think you're 100% correct about that. I, I mentioned something about it earlier, that whole um, trade-off of security. I trust ProtonMail for my email. Yeah. I trust them for my VPN access. That was a conscious trade-off that I had you know, to think about. Do I trust them to truly handle that data in a secure manner? And after thinking about it, after looking at all the service available, yes, I do trust them. I trust them for one, their knowledge is going to be greater when it comes to running that mail server. Two, I do truly value uh, Joan is to be trusted. That was a, you know, that's a social contract that by mm -hmm. me creating an account on their service and by using their service, I've agreed that yes, I do trust them to do that. And that's why I also mentioned earlier alternative that's something you're having trouble with because I know everybody when they first start getting to you know, how deep security can go how many things there are that can break that security profile it kind of seems doom and gloom I know there's a long long period of time where everything I did kind of became a little inconvenient with how much security wrapping and I had to dial back and be realistic about I'm not being tracked to if I've done I'm not a nation sector or I'm a target of a nation state it's just kind of just yeah. figuring out where your profile is. Uh, then no, that's that's a very solid point what? right there, actually, with the whole like, um, I know there's a lot of paranoia associated when it comes to the world oh, of yeah. privacy. I think what it really comes to is that, realistically speaking, right, you know, the FBI isn't watching your every move unless if you're like um, Edward Snowden or like, um, you know, some sort of, <laughs> <laughs> some sort of, uh, um, uh, you did something, right? And if you, they don't have a reason to look for you, you know, you don't have to be as paranoid about that. There's still some good security practices that you can do. Like if you're not using your webcam, you may as well cover it for those chances of spyware. I mean, there's there's no harm in it. I mean, um, if there's no harm in it, just why not type type of thing. And there's also that level of like, why use a service that is you know, stealing your data, privacy invasion, selling your, off your data to third parties that we don't even know how secure these third parties are. Um, but, you know, I'll talk about that later. But, um, you know, why use a service like that when there are plenty of alternatives that are just as good, just as good or not better um, that offer, you know, privacy protection, you know, um, respect for your online life, um, all this other stuff. So it's kind of like that, you know, why not? Why not just make sure your digital life could be better, safer, and insured? Um, so, I mean, that's why I was figuring. Kind of like, um, I don't know if you want to digress on that, Bati, but I think. No, so like what you're talking about, I mean, um, when it comes to just the security profile, you know, if you want to be absolutely safe when it comes to that web camera, remove it from the computer. But then it becomes an obstacle for when you need those types of situations. Right. Well, another alternative would be to cover it. I mean, it just matters. Like, you can go as far extremes of privacy. Mm -hmm. You can run every bit of data that comes through your network. You can always, you know, do VPNs with kill switches, which to me seems like a much more reasonable thing. For those who don't know, VPN kill switch, the moment it disconnects, you have problems connecting to that. It actually shuts down all traffic that was flowing through until it can be reestablished, which is a nice little feature for VPNs. But... There's extremes on every end, and then sometimes that is needed, depending on what's going on. If you are someone who finds themselves constantly being attacked, uh, you find your credit card data being stolen, that's the type of thing where you might step up that particular area of your security, but I think it's about moderation. You have to live that in moderation when it comes to Otherwise, you're just going to continue to find yourself in a state of not being able to flow. You want to listen to music, but because you're running every four node and all these different layers of encryptions, your song's buffering every 30 seconds, or it takes 15 minutes to load into the service to listen to it. Ooh, not that's a point I forgot to mention. Um, <laughs> sorry, sorry to kind of cut, uh, cut you off here. Um, I think there's a kind of a general, I guess, rule of law when it comes to privacy is that the more privacy and like security you have intact in your digital life, Tech, typically, the lot more difficult your digital life will end up being. 
um, it's just kind of like a weird um, phenomenon that kind of goes around because, right, um, a lot of the uh, more easy features when it comes to privacy or uh, when it comes to your like your digital life tend to be fairly privacy invasive things like cookies, right? Remembering in remembering your login sessions after you close in the browser. Um, that's not technically the world's most you know safe thing. Um, so having like, you know, like I know Firefox will like, you know, destroy all cookies, clear cache as soon as you close the browser. Um, some like Chrome, for example, won't do that. Um, and that can be kind of, I guess, dangerous on your end. But if you're, you know, using a service like this um, with Chrome, if you close your computer and or, I mean, if you close the browser and open the browser back up, you will still be signed into like Google Docs. You'll still be signed into um, your Gmail um, with something like. Firefox and you did the same, same thing, if you were to close the browser when you open it, sometimes you would have to just re-log into your um, Gmail account, which is fine. And I'm cool with doing that because that's just, you know, ease of access. I'm switching between accounts anyway. Um, but if that's like part of your digital life, that's, you know, something you need to consider is like the, the further you deep dive into privacy, um, typically um, a lot more difficult some things will be. And this doesn't go for everything. I mean, if you're just using VPNs, if you're using um, like a more secure browser and such, you know, you'll be fine. But I mean, if you're like, you know, deep diving into like, you know, level four privacy protection, you know, blocking the FBI from watching every move and um, all, this other, <laughs> all this other stuff, then um, you're going to have to deal kind of with those faults. Um, so yeah, well, I just want I think at that point, if you're at level four, like, nation states yeah, are right. down line. Like, you've got way less, thing, or way bigger things to worry about than the fact that Spotify is not loading your YouTube <laughs> properly because you're encryption. I think uh, at that point you're more worried about, like, oh, no, I'm in some serious danger. <laughs> yeah. But you're, like, I think that's the big thing to know with that, that handoff. Um, we've covered on a lot of important topics, and I feel like we've missed one that's very important. We've talked about, you know, separating work stuff from, you know, personal stuff, but more than just on those accounts, separate everything. Separate a whole different password manager for those. Separate, um, like, don't get complacent and stick something that's work-related into personal. Because mm -hmm. that right there, that one slip-up could be mm -hmm. the thing that's going to happen. You know, you think, oh, oh yeah. personal stuff. It's not as important versus my jobs, you know, network stuff. That's all in there. You know, I've got patient stuff in here. Well, one day you accidentally save it to the spot somebody suddenly your you know less secure personal data is now mixed in with that private data yeah. that's cracked you know, the data's kind of just floating there. like try to separate as much as you can do what you can to create it. solid of walls between who those are uh, i know some people i brought back uh linux users earlier um if you separate they'll so they'll create an account for work stuff and they'll create an account for personal those accounts never cross. If on that personal account, you listen to YouTube with premium subscription or you listen to Spotify with that premium subscription and everything, don't sign into your account with your work stuff. Yeah. Especially with Google. Google's real big about once you sign in once, it doesn't matter what the service is. Oh, it's yeah. The people. ecosystems in like a lot of these oh. um, companies are very blowing. I know like um, the concept of ecosystems like within Apple, right? If you got like a MacBook, yeah. the iPhone, iPad, all your photos are going to be synced. All this is going to be synced between devices. So they do that purposely, not only to make it more convenient for Mac users, but to make it inconvenient for those who may have like the iPhone, but may have like a Windows computer, right? If you wanted to like sync your photos, you would have to use some sort of third party service to do so rather than just having your photos be able to be synced between all your devices. Um, I guess that's kind of like a... Um, like an economic strategy there um, but it can lead to a lot of inconvenience um, if you are kind of leading I guess leading out of that like ecosystem um, but yeah sorry to cut you off there but no uh. no uh, but I mean Google's the biggest culprit when I bring up the accounts kind of crossing every um, I have a I Gmail accounts have one for work one for personal and the work one's just for a couple services like uh, Chrome Remote Desktop Stuff like that for whenever I need to do stuff on my system, but I'm away from my. System. It allows me to set it up where I can log in from my phone. I made the mistake the other day of signing in on my work and personal account, 
And so immediately I was getting flooded, both those accounts being put together. And then when I got on my laptop where I've only signed into one of those accounts in this profile, suddenly I'm still seeing data from very yeah. much a big cross of those. Yeah. Be for those, uh, there's a little video on YouTube that's called Ungoogling. Um, if you've, if you've ever watched it, you know that Google is deep into your phone when it comes to the way, specifically Samsung. For those who haven't seen it, go take a look. Real yeah. like, take a look and see how long it takes to actually remove Google as something. You know, your services run off. You want to watch YouTube? It's always going to sign in with your Google account, sign in into your, or from your Gmail. You logged in to check your emails, but, oh, well, don't worry about yeah. it because we went ahead and signed you into the Play Store. I don't, so you I can, don't think you, you can, know, can sign into apps. Google. I mean, sorry, I don't think you can sign into YouTube without a Google account, right? Uh, there is a way. They figured it out in the video, but long story short, like, Google is, like, you have your OS layer, and then you have Google, which basically <laughs> is that filter of if you want to do anything, you have to give it to us first. And yeah. One. Very much what it feels like. I think there's very few areas in your that's not the case. And this video just goes through, like, what it took to move Google from this. The worst part is that when that update rolls around, all those Google products and all that stuff that he did are going to be right back into place. Yeah. So, it was just kind of a nice little study to kind of show like uh, how deep Google is on your device. It's like those sort of accounts. So yeah, like don't get complacent with account types issues because like I said, one one accidental sign in on the wrong server suddenly crosses all your data and everything. Stuff and you know your two separate emails, one for work and one for play, converted based into yeah two separate emails, but they're always going to be yeah and not just to Google. Probably that stuff works. Um, if you ever get curious and you want to see just how much big data is, there's a site called Pipple. P I P L. I think it's P I P L. Oh, I thought you said Pimple. Uh, no, no, P I P L. <laughs> so uh, Pipple. So if you get on Pipple, uh, you can actually search up your name, and it'll pull up everything that it has on your name, Facebook accounts, all this stuff, and then it'll actually start creating webs of who it think your fan, who it thinks your family is. And, friends are and stuff like that and it'll show how that data has been collected and how it's been associated you know things that you know and it'll link alternate stuff like that like it, it shows um just how much data that is sounds like an awesome OSINT tool <laughs> it is an awesome OSINT. I, I have used it a couple times the problem is it has to be real world it's like cts stuff where we would normally use it mm -hmm. it takes months to collect that data for those associations to be so a ctf that was you know that account was made last week yeah. that you would need those types of things but for real world I was, by all means I was able to show my family who's not very privacy uh, here just by searching you know your name here's what I was able to find about you it doesn't take much for somebody and so that's another one of those tools you can add in that lockbox along with um, have I been pulling privacy.com um, any sort of OSINT public uh, search that has that little networking feature you can see what else know with you? Who have you been associated on your community line? And sometimes the uh, geographical metadata, depending on certain data dump, yeah, uh, they'll associate who they think you know based on like um, that one's a little fuzzier because a lot of age groups kind of get grouped up together. Like they're not going to grab kids who are under eighteen simply because there yeah, are laws no, against law. certain yeah, naming yeah. posts like that. But the other thing, uh, when you have patterns tools obviously everybody in this one town from nine to five is not it's going to be in the same place together throughout high school but when you start getting to be an adult and they start looking at some data like that some of that gps tracking stuff that comes from your phone provider stuff like that is a cool thing to look at and see how they created this network about who you are and what you've done yeah it's, it's interesting it's interesting it's also disturbing but it is interesting it is it's fair that's yeah. what i was talking about so for those of you who are still hanging in here and listen to this gone through this entire thing research it it's fun to see what's there but take it slow because it's very easily to get in this mindset of i'm being watched 27 yeah but what you also have to consider is the same amount of data that's being collected on me it's being collected i'm a grain of sand in a beach Picking me out, I have to do something completely abnormal. Yeah. You know, different. 
And uh, a thing with privacy and encryption and stuff like that, uh, like I just said, sometimes you have to do stuff that's abnormal to get noticed. Sometimes that encryption, that extra bit of security is what will you see normal. If you're doing strictly web browsing from you know, Tor, if you refuse to do anything but browse from some sort of network, I wouldn't say that's bad. Mm -hmm. But if they're looking for a reason after the fact, well, he's clearly hiding something because he's always using encryption. <laughs> that sort of thing, which it, it's a double-edged blade of like, want to protect, but how far you go until you become the crazy gun nut down the road. Ooh, Monty, <laughs> can I ask you a question? Yeah, let's go for it. So... Um, I've done plenty of talks and speeches and stuff about, you know, promoting online security and safety and privacy and such. And what I often hear as kind of an excuse to ignore privacy is like, well, I got nothing to hide. Uh, what, like, so like they don't need like privacy features if they got quote nothing yeah, to hide. Yeah. What do you have to say like in response to that? Um, I'll digress on my point after, but. I just want to hear what you have to All say. Right. So, a lot of the people who are looking at that, when they say that, I have nothing to... It's not like we think you have some clandestine secret. It's not that we think NSA finds you so important you've got to look on. It's the little things. Like, if I post pictures on Facebook about my kids, and in those pictures I've got, you know, my street address, accidentally, because the one of the houses just happens to be there, and some creep in the neighborhood, you know, sees a house and recognizes or, you know, bank account details being stolen, stuff like that. Being conscious isn't about your big secrets that you got to have. It's about kind of that outward looking in perspective of how much my real, how much can people tell about me who they don't need to know? Do people need to know that I'm at spin class from four to five every day? No, but somebody who's trying to rob my house, that might be useful information to them. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I make frequent purchases here at a specific place, or I'm constantly there at this place. I mean, it lets people know where you are. You're kind of tagging, uh, not only in the digital aspect. That's the thing that people can understand. Is this doesn't just apply to the digital. Um, your network security is very important for the, for the network. But simply knowing that the entire family is going to be out on vacation for a week, that, you know, their house cleaner's got the sniffle, so she won't be there as well, so... You know, house may be a little dusty when you get back and you're dreading that cleaning. Oh, no. Um, that right there is kind of red flags being set up for that's a target. That's something to worry about. As well as uh, we look at phishing scheme. We talk about security in that aspect as well. That data you put out is generating a perfect scope of who you are to target. If you're posting about your grandchild being the greatest thing in the world and there's so many years to go to the high school, well, suddenly now all I've got to do is, hey, your grandson was on the way to school, school name, da da da, drop the address, whatever. You when he got in a horrible car accident, here's the link to the website, or here's the link to the directions to that hospital. Get there fast, he may not have much time. Well, suddenly now, all that data that you provided it wasn't important because you had nothing to hide. You were a victim, a target. Yeah. Like, I think that's the big thing. Is Nobody thinks that you have big C. Nobody thinks that you're super. But that doesn't mean the person next to you isn't. You are just as much a gateway to somebody else. So I, I would say that that's the biggest thing that I have. When, when I hear that argument, that's my thing. It's just how much data are you actually putting out that affects you in the real world? Yeah. No, I, I think that's very solid. I think that's a very solid point you brought up. And I kind of kind of go, I guess, my point of view on this kind of topic is like, I feel as if that's simply untrue. I feel as if you're not going to be telling random strangers about your kids, what school your kids go to, um, if you have like a family like that. Or um, there's certain information that you just don't tell people. You wouldn't like, you're not just going to live in your home with your front door always open. There's a lock on your door for okay. a reason, right? Um, I feel like it's the same thing with your digital life. I feel like, oh, well, I don't need to do this, that, and the third. Well, I think you do. You There's walls on your house for a reason outside of the fact of wind and weather. 
is to prevent random people from walking in your house. Because I'm sure if you're just watching your house and there's some random dude on your couch, you call the police. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, it's that simple. Um, you don't want other people invading in your personal life. And I feel like just because it's on a digital platform doesn't mean it's just as important as that physical platform. Um, I feel like, and even on the level of like social media, for example, I know social media, um, despite its positives, there's plenty of negatives. And you always hear um, about like the thing before you post or whatever for cyberbullying and um, all these other factors. But you have to think about, I don't know if anyone here, I'm, you know, I'm still young, so I don't have any kids or whatever. But I know, you know, if you have a family and you have that type of thing, um, these platforms are affecting children. I don't know if you've ever seen The Social Dilemma on Netflix, um, but that is definitely something you should check out if you are kind of concerned of the effect of social media on, um, like, I guess, the youth, uh, because that level of privacy or that, inform that level of privacy invasion and information collection is kind of extreme. And it's um, almost disappointing to see um, that's kind of the level that these things have gone to. And I really, really wish, and in fact, I would like to, once Cosmodium's on a higher platform, highly advocate for new privacy laws and digital information laws, because I feel like that's something really important that doesn't really, I guess, exist within our modern, um, I guess, day and age. And I know Facebook's quote unquote advocating for privacy law, even though they are, uh, I'm not going to even talk about Facebook, but yeah, but, <laughs> like yeah. Um, but I know, I know, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but what I do know is that they are currently trying to advocate for a lot of the new privacy laws. And I think, um, on that front, I totally agree that there is a need for new privacy law, new information, like new, I guess, like judicial, you know, like a quote unquote constitutional law on this digital age because there is very limited um, restrictions on, um, you know, the internet and what people have been able to do. And I feel as if as times are changing, it's something very important that we kind of need to focus on is that um, level of, I guess, cyber law. Because um, even like hacking and stuff wasn't even considered like a serious crime until recent years. Um, I even know of like... Uh, I, would, I wouldn't say that it wouldn't be a serious crime, but I think that it made it to where there very much was, you could only be a victim. I yeah. do think that was a big problem. Um, yeah, yeah, that's I remember right. being like 18, and I can't remember when the law came out. I want to say it was around then, but it I finally became legal that if you were being hacked, you could hack back, as long as you could prove that you were being hacked first. Um, so, like, if there was actively a network intrusion into your, you know, company, you were able to dig deeper than just what logs were on my network. You were allowed to probe a little more and actually try to, you know, defend yourself. Yeah, like self-defense, nice right? That if that someone shoots you, you should bet. But I, I think we've seen some growth, but I've also seen a lot of, you know, jumping back. We're seeing a lot more power being handed over to companies that are that we're putting so much trust into. And I think that's what's scary. Uh, I was thinking about it a minute ago. You know, and about that type of data you put out there. A lot of people, uh, for sensitive subjects, with, you know, being cancer right this month, I'm going to go ahead and bring this up. Um, your medical data. You may tell everybody about your diagnosis because you need that. You may go and tell only your spouse. But picture now Facebook is doing your auto check-in. You know, you've got it set up to ping, oh, so-and-so just got to this spot. Well, now your Facebook's just broadcasted everybody. Hey, I just checked into the cancer research. Suddenly that secret you wanted is now out there. Yeah. Stuff like that. It's important to look at what's being put out there, what permissions you're allowed. goes back to that who, where, and for how long. You know, yeah. Who needs it? I what totally do they need? Agree. Why do they need it? And for how long do they need Exactly. They have the restrictions you were talking about. Because I know there was this article that came out a while back. This had to be like 2018, maybe even previous. 
Um, I think the article was talking about Target and their um, level of like um, information collection and how they were able to learn that a girl was pregnant before before her own father knew just off of her like purchase history and such. I don't know if you guys heard about that. It was in the news and such, but um, like things like that, I think are just like a whole new unnecessary <laughs> uh, uh, level of um, collection. So I think that's kind of to kind of digress back into the point of this is like kind of having that, you know, s- security routine kind of understanding of how you can stay safe online and kind of keep that level of privacy. I'm not saying go, you know, full fledged, you know, black hat, you know, off the grid, you're only hopping through tour nodes. Oh, yeah. I mean, just have some level of privacy where you can hey, you know, you're safe from intrusion, you know, and I guess, you know, the government does have um, the right to, I guess, you know, view certain information off of um, what you're doing, but that doesn't mean you should just throw it out there. Um, take care of your digital life as if it were your physical life. Um, don't, you know, you, oh. you lock your door at home, so you lock your door, you know, your quote unquote digital door. Going back to what we were talking about earlier, the social contracts, and you brought up just now government having that right to stuff. I find myself constantly balancing on this teetering edge of a blade where I, I kind of kind of do it. Because we know that's how these systems are set up. We know that at all times these things are being monitored. Whether they say they are or had per- they are. But we don't change the services. We mm-hmm. continue to use Facebook, we continue to use Twitter, we continue to browse with Chrome and continue to some of those little conscious changes helps, but what happens whenever, you know, yeah. alphabet soup agencies have their own <laughs> sub-delegated, you know, company that they've invested in. Technically, they don't own it, but whatever deals they have in the background, those exist, and we, we've kind of conscious of them. Yeah. Uh, like the same I was talking about earlier, I trust Proton, no, my data, that's a conscious decision I made by me using the ISP that I signed in conscious agreeing that the data I'm giving to them, you know, they're going to either take care of it or they're not, but that's the decision I'm making. How well are they going to treat what I'm giving them? And I, I guess that's how it goes with our government, too. Um, it, I know I don't want to get political about it, but as much as I hate to say it, that's what our environment is here. Uh, as U.S. citizens, we know that we're being watched. We know what our stuff is. And if you don't like it, it it's kind of hard to say get out of the reach of it. It's what it is. Yeah. I mean, but going back to what you're talking about, it's the whole, if you don't have anything to hide, why hide it? it it's not about those big things, the little things. Protect who you are, but protect the, the moments. Don't let those become your weak points. Don't become so obsessed with your security that you can't ever get anything done, but don't be so lenient and open about it that yeah. people could just be you at me. You'll never see me post anything super revealing. You'll never see me post my address. Oh, I'm so and so from you know so and so part, or I. Yeah. You know, I can see this from my place. I don't put information like that out. I may put out the job I work. I haven't updated where I worked at in two years on Facebook. <laughs> Not because I don't trust people, and I think that's going to put me at risk, a company risk, just simply because I've accepted the fact that I don't want that information to be used. At any point, mm-hmm. I don't want that information. To my target weak spot. If that makes. Sense. No, that makes. I that, honestly that, think it makes perfect sense. Decision. No, no, no. I think, yeah. I think you're touching on a lot of points that I would like to think a lot of people kind of share, um, and even me. Like I'm definitely with you on like a lot of the things that you're saying. I think it's. I think it's super important that you know people are educated on what this kind of front is. I think there's a lot of like different views when it comes to this. There's either like the, well, I have nothing to hide, so I don't really care, but they don't fully understand by not having basic, you know, online safety and privacy, um, I guess, routine and concepts and practices, the kind of danger they're putting themselves in. But aside from that, also kind of like going into that whole level of like losing... Um, how do I say this? Like losing that. Um, 
how I, I'm not exactly sure I want to word this per se, but how you can kind of stray from or lose like that level of I guess I guess online safety. Um, I'm not trying to. I'm not too sure on exactly how I want to um, digress into this. And um, seems like Mossy may have some internet issues right now, which is fine. Um, but I think that's like I guess a very valid, very valid and um, important point to kind of cover, it's like the differences between privacy and security. Um, those and how they correlate, how they combine, and how you can kind of really implement those practices into your life. Uh, I see, Matsu, you just returned. Um, to make sure everything's good. Yes, sorry. All right. No, it's all good. Um, but no, yeah, I think, you know, Matsu brings up some really good points, and I think it's really important for people to kind of educate themselves on the importance of, you know, online safety and keeping a good, healthy p- practice of privacy and, um, you know, those types of practices, because... I guess as a security education company, you know, we should, we make these efforts to make sure you guys can kind of be informed about these types of topics and, you know, educate yourselves and learn so that way you know how to adapt and kind of implement those practices into your own life. I think that's the big thing is we want to see people grow, not only in their knowledge of, you know, the security principles and stuff like that, but we want to see you grow in your everyday daily life. This these simple things like, you know, do I use a VPN? Do I like just put my card information, you know, directly? Do I use PayPal for this? Do I do that? Those little things can make all the difference. Um, we, we just want to see people be safe. And I think that's the whole point of us teaching this is we want to teach you, you know, best practice here. How are you, because like, the thing that we're trying to train people is for one, the everyday user, how to be safe, how to be more security conscious and how to just know your system a little better. I think that's the big thing. We focus a lot on cybersecurity here, but I think also understanding your system is a good oh, yeah. place to be at, not to freak out when it beeps when it's supposed to boop type situation. But for the people who are here that are trying to be security professionals, who want to go in and be sysadmins, who want to go in and be, you know, somewhere high up in the IT field, it, it kind of brings into question, you know, your qualifications whenever you don't feel like you can secure your own privacy. And now you're sitting here in charge of everybody else's privacy at the same time. It's one of the situations where you have to evaluate and see, you know, how qualified am I to protect myself as well as other people? Because security on a bigger level like that, it's now in your hands. It's your responsibility. It it sucks to say that, you know, if something goes wrong, it's kind of on you. But that's how it is. When you accept a role like that, that's what you're accepting the responsibility. Mm. That's why they pay so well because you were the one taking responsibility for these things. You're saying, I have the knowledge to do this. So I think the thing that I really was trying to get out of that was that Cosmodium's not here just to teach you cybersecurity, how to hack, how to be a penetration tester, how to be a bug hunter, how to be a good CTF player. We're here to invest in the knowledge of everybody here. We want to see people come out better when it comes to computers, because let's face it, Computers are here. They're not going anywhere. And there's a lot of people running around with very sophisticated devices in their pockets. They have no clue how it's working. And there's people being taken advantage because they don't know. So many things are not built with security in mind. So many things are just left straight open. And I think that's the thing that scares us the most is that we're seeing these things that we as security professionals, we as penetration to, uh, sorry, as uh, CTF players, those are the puzzles they set us up to use. Those are the things we're yeah. set to try to learn against. The problem is that you would think they would end at the game, but we see it in real life. I mean, we brought up a while back um, a small penetration test that we did for a friend of ours for an application. Any user who would have used his application and it would have gotten hacked, that would have been in his hands. Yeah. That would have been his responsibility to take care of because he did not understand the technologies he was using. He had a great dream and a great idea, and I still think it's great, and he's still working on to be about the security. So, Jordan, if you're listening, keep on, Ben. Uh, I look forward to seeing Yeah, for sure, next. for but sure. He has to understand, you know, what he's doing, and all his users have to agree that by putting my information in your hands, he's going to take care of it. Yeah. 
And I yeah, that inherent trust. Which, what trust you're giving. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, Like, you, you know, I guess part of that whole concept of the social contract to begin with about how, like, hey, you know, I'm giving up, like, a lot of some, like, my, I guess, I guess personal information because most websites are going to, you know, collect your information regardless on some level. Okay. Whether how they handle it is kind of more of that privacy level. Um, but there's just, you know, it's just kind of inherent, right? It's just how the process works. Um, I think what's kind of important to understand is, you know, how they're handling that information, right? Um, this is something I guess, I, I don't know how I have not touched this topic yet, um, but Rock You, Rock You is the perfect example of what we've been talking <laughs> about this entire time. Um, yes. I'll actually, the most read article on the website is the story of Rock You article. I just dropped the link in the chat now. Um, this, I, first of all, again, it's the most read article because simply of how important and vital the story is within the security world. And if the name Rock You sounds familiar to you because you're involved in the security world, it's because it's the name of the rockyou.txt file. And this is um, a old social, I guess, a social networking type company. Um, or a social networking and application vendor that um, they had, um, you know, the service that a ton of people use. I think there were 32 million users that used RockU, and they stored all these users' passwords in plain text. Um, yeah, it's it's not it's not a good practice. Uh, <laughs> but what kind of um, I guess came out of this, right, is that there was this hacker who attacked RockU using a SQL injection attack and were, was able to retrieve um, all the credentials to all the users that were using this application, right? Um, again, there were 32 million compromised passwords, right? What you need to understand is this guy, he didn't, um, you know, hold it for ransom. He didn't, you know, um, do some other random crazy thing. He just threw it out on the internet and wreaked havoc, right? Now, kind of the um touch on our original point right um like when we first started talking about this was repeated passwords right um i in the article i do talk about um i guess the outbreak of the um effects of the story of rock you or the rock you breach and how um all of those people who used those simple basic repeated passwords um were affected by this so people outside of their rock you account they got their um, you know, Gmail accounts, um, you know, uh, like email accounts or whatever, banking information, um, other accounts that they may have or popular services that may have used. Um, it's simple. You can use something like um, what's it called Sherlock match usernames to other accounts and then just try using the passwords that they were, you know, leaked onto the database. It's not rocket science. This is um, <laughs> pretty easy stuff. So kind of, you know, retouch on that, you know, Rock you, um, there's all 32 million users that, you know, trusted this service, that used this service, and um, they relied on this service. And this, you know, they stored these, all these, you know, all 32 million credentials in plain text. And through that SQL injection attack, this hacker was able to retrieve them the right online. So it's very important to understand, like, hey, you are trusting these services. You're relying on these services to hold your information securely. And if they can't do that, that's a huge deficit on your end as well as the company's end. And it's not even your fault. But I guess that kind of comes back to that online safety, right? If you're using um, different unique passwords, you would be fine after this data breach. You would just change your password and you're good. Because, <laughs> I mean, there, you wouldn't have to worry about it because your repeated passwords that leading to other accounts as well um, it wouldn't have to necessarily affect your, um, you know, your other, I guess, digital accounts. And I know I'm sugarcoating it a little bit by saying you're fine, but, you know, just change your password. But kind of getting that concept out there of how important this is, um, Rock you. this was such an a important event in cybersecurity, and it has changed cybersecurity so much by using this rockyou.txt account in a lot of security engagements, CTFs, Design the Third. Um, but yeah, the story of Rocky is very, I guess, a very important event. And I see, um, Matsu, you dropped in the Dark Knight Diaries episode off this, I believe. Um, yes, I did. Yeah. Over Rocky, for those of you who want to really get into it and hear about it, um, 
I talk about Darkened Diaries all the time. They're great. He's a great, you know, podcaster, uh, Jack Recyber. He's got a lot of great content, very entertaining. It is so easy to get lost in the stories and his voice. So be careful. Um, it's also a good way to fall asleep, not because his voice is boring, <laughs> but it's real soothing. So, um, you know, it, he's got a lot of episodes backlog, and he covers a lot of these things, these security stuff. Um, it, it's very much an undertone in a lot of what he does when he covers these and he goes as far as to cover things with nation-state actors or people who were very much in contact with nation-state actors. But uh, one of the things you touched upon just a minute ago was, you know, change your password and it's fixed. I don't think that's that simple anymore. Yeah, no, that's now what I said. That's what so I was saying. Be connected. Yeah, no, I, I, back then, definitely, like, if you just change your password, you were fine. Worst case scenario, you post on Facebook, like, got hacked again, LOL. <laughs> but nowadays, like... Banking services pair up with your apps. I mean, Google stores credit card information, like we were talking about earlier, between devices. I sign in, want to get it, and as long as I have my password there, it brings up my you know, debit cards from my previous account. Stuff like that. It's no longer just a change of password and it's clean, because now that data is there. Yeah. Damage can be done. I mean, I'd love to say that it's back to the old days where something gets hacked, we change the password, and it's over, but people are getting smarter and smarter they're taking advantage of more and more services and there's a lot more interconnectivity between these things we've made it a part of a crucial infrastructure and i think that's why it makes me so sad to see so many people carrying around these devices and put so much trust into them but not mm-hmm. know what they are what's, yeah. what they're doing who they're yeah. talking to like the devices themselves but i think that's that's the biggest thing the biggest thing to tell you about your security I can't tell you to go download one app. I can't tell you to go use one service. What I can tell you to do is dig into what's going on with your phone, into your computer, what you're, the services you're using are doing. And the only warning I can really give you is, you know, in moderation. In moderation is the biggest thing. Don't <coughs> seep too deep. Don't prevent yourself from being able to work by having so much security. You know, uh, Build your security profile based off of you, not who you think you are or who's watching you. Like, I can build my you know, security profile off of Edward Snowden and say, you know, I'm covered completely <laughs> and that might be true. I might have the best encryption that I'll never get cracked or I'll never have to worry about being watched ever again and I could decide to skip off the grid next week. The problem is that what am I actually doing in the time? I'm taking almost two times, three times as much time to do a simple task than I would normally because of securities. Yeah. You know, research is always is going to be the most important thing. Everything we talk about, it's always, this tool's nice, this service is cool, but the knowledge that goes with it, what's going on in the world, what's going on with your devices, the software you're using, where you're putting that trust, mm, yeah. that's going to be your key. Um, I think a good point to add on to what you're saying, because you're making a very valid point right now, is like, we're not saying don't use Gmail or don't use this or don't use yes. that. We're talking about how you use it, right? Be smart with it. Don't let it just, you know, one Gmail for all your, you know, I guess your entire life. If you don't need to use it, then don't use it. But if you need it, that's perfectly fine. Just be smart with it. Use it in the way areas that you need it. You have those restrictions as Mossy was talking about. Like, make sure you're kind of limiting, I guess, the quote unquote scope of you know your what this account is and if you know that there is um like privacy invasion involved in that or a risk in your online safety involved with that just use it smartly use it effectively so that way you know the best way how to use it right um so i I just want to add on to like that kind of point i think i've said as much as i can about this topic like i said i think i've touched about everything i can um was there anything else you want to add on to it no, I think um, this is a good point of kind of ending up here talking about, um, I guess, getting to, you know, quote unquote, obfuscating your, your data and kind of um, getting into that level of online safety and privacy. And those of you who are um, checking out the chat, you guys can see um, some of the links that we have left there. If you guys want to check out fellow creator, you know, the hated one, some of the articles we've written about these kind of topics, if you want us to deep dive into it. And if you guys are curious about any other topics, just let us know in a comment or hit us up on Discord because we are almost on the Discord every day. We talk about it in most of our streams here about how cool the community is over there. And if you're trying to get into hacking, if you're a little bit newer to this field, that's definitely something 
um, you should definitely check out if you guys are, you know, wanting to connect with us a little bit more. Um, but other than that, it seems like there are no other um, last remarks. Um, so I think we're going to uh, end. Go ahead. One last thing before we. Oh, sorry. Uh, just as a final reminder, um, join us on Halloween. Come and help us make Where, a difference. Yeah. We are doing that stream with the Capture of the Flag games for Hope for the Heart. Every bit of money that you donate will be going to them. And we will be hearing from them a little bit. I have talked with their director, and they will be there. We're hoping to get a couple of special guests. So if you'd like to, please come out there and make a difference. Have a good afternoon, and we're not asking for much. We really yeah. aren't. This isn't for us. This is for something that I think all of us can agree is touched our lives in one way or another. So yeah. let's do something together. No, uh, yeah, definitely try. Um, if you guys can be there, then definitely show up. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, pretty chill and you know making a difference and that's what we do here so um, I think again we're going to end it off here um, thank you guys for listening to these um, I guess Sunday streams where we kind of just talk and stuff and hopefully this was something you guys were able to enjoy so um, make sure you leave a like subscribe and do the whole YouTube algorithm thing and we will see you guys in the next stream oh check out tomorrow's video because that thing is going to be amazing I don't know how long <laughs> it's going to be on YouTube but if you guys can get there in time, then most definitely check it out. Um, you guys will understand tomorrow, trust me. Uh, <laughs> but uh, again, um, thank you guys so much for watching. We really appreciate you guys. And hope you guys have a blessed one. So uh, stay happy, stay positive, and as always, happy hacking.